Thank you very much, Miguel. Um, <clears throat> what we'd like to do now is to open uh, this uh, debate uh, to further discussion, and we're happy to take any questions or comments uh, from the floor about these uh, two approaches. Um, let me just uh, first begin by uh, asking Dr. Chung, you, you uh, first of all, I would say that um, I'm very envious of your 3% uh, adult obesity rate in Korea. I would uh, love to be doing laparoscopic and other surgery in, in, a, in a patient population like that. But it really is an impressive experience that you have with over 3,300 cases. Can you say a little bit more about the training that you do? I mean, what when you have uh, individuals that come from the U.S., is it observational? Uh, are they able to uh, participate in the OR, and how long, how many cases, do you have certain minimum requirements? Uh, yeah, so uh, I have so, uh, many the international fellow, the so training period I think is from one month to one year. So, uh, so uh, to, for the international uh, fellows, uh, at first I, I Make, I, I, I make them to, to observe my procedure uh, one month for one month and then uh, cooperate after then cooperate my operation or assist my operation uh, after two, two months later that he can start a real uh, robotic surgery so as you can see the Malaysian uh, fellow uh, the training period is nine months, so after the three months, he can do by himself the robotic thyroid surgery. So the, he can show the very excellent result. So I want to say that in robotic the thyroid surgery is a new technique, uh, new surgical technique. So until now, there is no well-designed training program. So in, especially in uh, America, in USA, there are also the U.S. surgeon no experience with endoscope thyroid surgery. So uh, for U.S. surgeon also the, the try to make the, uh, the new training program for the robotic thyroid surgery. So if, if I understood you correctly, so it's a several month mm -hmm. fellowship uh, yeah. that you have. And for the first month, you're just sort of just watching. Job, yeah. And then for two months, you assist. You assist yeah. And then you begin. Yeah, How many yeah. cases would you assist on before you start actually doing them? Uh, how, how many so cases do you do? can you do in a day when you, with this approach? Uh, actually, the, in our institute, every working day procedure the, from the three cases to six cases. So, three to six cases uh, in yeah, one so room? So the fellow can observe in, in a week the, um, about 12 or more. Cases. Let me ask the panelists, uh, um, are any of you doing endoscopic or robotic thyroidectomies? Uh, yes, Dr. Linus. I, I had the privilege to visit uh, Professor Chung and spend less time than he described and uh, try the first cases in Europe. Uh, 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 with his aid, we invited him and we proceeded. So. The main thing is his approach. Once you learn how to make the chunk tunnel, so you have in front of you the thyroid, you are tempted to just put your hand, your fingers, and pull it out, but the hole is not that big. So we succumb to the temptation, instead of the robot, after a few cases, we just put uh, the usual uh, endoscopic uh, setup. And we were able to do that with a significantly less cost and uh, less time. But uh, I think, in my experience, because of the difficulties uh, of the population, 35% obesity in Europe, in our country, and because of other reasons, and especially the problems you have with all this technology, the risk of spreading thermal energy to the nerve. So you are obliged to do a less than total, total operation that you can do when you see the nerve in front of you and you don't have to put a source of energy. So uh, I reserve this type of procedure, an incision away from the neck, only 
in 4% of the population that do have a history of keloid. If you have a young lady or a man or anybody with a history of keloid, I think you should not make an incision in the neck, whether smaller or larger. In that case, you should uh, invite Professor Chang to come to your institution. <laughs> Excellent comments. Thank you very much. Dr. Du, did you have a comment? Dr. Kwan Du from uh, University of California, San Francisco. Well, or you can just send the patient to Korea. It's a short trip. Um, yes. Now, I have watched uh, Wung Yun uh, did these operations, and it is quite impressive. And I think what uh, Dimitri said is also correct, that by the time you use that seven centimeter uh, axillary incision in a thin patient with the thing here, it's equivalent to you and I doing a BMI 40 patient with a large substernal goiter. And so it almost, you can finish the case open. Um, and, and I think the, there's a, the, the approach actually is set up very, very nicely. And we, you know, I tried a couple of just trans axillary without the robot. And I think, uh, and I also use robot for other things, and I, I, I believe that it does add something to it. But the question I have for Wun Yun is that there are a lot of people in Asia, in the less well-off countries, that do a lot of transaxillary operations without the robot and appear to have good results. Can he comment on those? Uh, you mean an endoscope direct surgery? Uh, I'm sorry, I can't. The, the, the question is, uh, there are uh, surgeons in uh, uh, some uh, Asian countries that don't have perhaps the resources for the robot, but are but are doing transaxillary. Mm -hmm operations. Can you comment on that approach? Yeah, so uh, I, uh, even in Asia, the number of the, the Da Vinci system is increasing and increasing, but currently the, many surgeons want to endoscope thyroid surgery and transaxillary barba approach, but uh, I think the, uh, it's a trend, uh, transient uh, time for the period for the uh, robotic surgery. So they want the robotic surgery. So after training of the endoscope thyroid surgery, uh, they can start the robotic thyroid surgery. So I think the Asian, the many Asian surgeons uh, want to do the endoscope or robotic surgery. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Dr. Rera, I, I think you, you, you made s some excellent points about the techniques to minimize the scar in the neck. I think probably we, in general, don't pay enough at attention to that. The other thing that I, that I do is I try not to leave any um, foreign material in the skin. So I'll do a pull through subcuticular stitch and either put tapes or glue on and then just pull it out so there's no um, suture in the skin to react in. So I'm curious if the other panel, rest of the panelists have any other tricks that they use to minimize scar formation in the neck, which is largely what this is about. I, I, wanted to, I wanted to point out that several recent studies have addressed this issue of small versus large, longer incision and patient satisfaction. In, in all of them was found, and we do have in the recent issue of surgery, or our study, that from the patient's perspective, really makes no difference whether you have an incision two, three, four, or five centimeter, as long as you don't have complications. So this is very significant if the patient or the majority, 80, 90%, really don't care about the incision because at the end of the year, if you make the incision according to what Dr. Herrera said, in the skin crease, it's very hard to, to, to notice except these 4% of the patients with uh, keloid then why go through the ordeal of uh, uh, putting scopes either through the axilla or through the mouth or through the breast or other uh, new inventions? So this is a very significant question that we have to keep in mind. Okay. Dr. Damon. Yes, um, thank you very much for those presentations. Um, I would just like to emphasize uh, the importance of patient selection um, with, with uh, these new approaches. And 
Um, this is particularly true with um, the robotic or the endoscopic transaxillary approach. And there have been some uh, really horrific um, complications reported, um, esophageal transection, uh, brachial plexus injury, and the like. Um, simply complications that we don't see with conventional thyroid surgery. So if um, you are interested in starting or learning these techniques, um, we don't really know the best pathway because everyone will be a little bit different and there's no way to standardize that pathway at present. But I would just encourage you to approach this with great caution. Start with very easy cases and um, very carefully uh, in a tapered way advance your, um, your technique. I think we're headed towards maybe more modified neck dissections and perhaps with that operation in expert hands, the balance does tilt um, maybe towards endoscopic approaches as far as cosmetic outcomes because of the large incisions that are uh, necessary for those operations. Um, so that's a question, I guess. Where do you see this headed um, uh, with regards to neck dissection in the setting of thyroid cancer? Let, let's open that up to the panelists. Any, any comments about the, uh, is there an advantage if you're adding a neck dissection to a total thyroidectomy? Alan, do you want Dr. Sipperstein from uh, Cleveland Clinic. So I do almost all of my neck dissections through a transverse incision and find out uh, with very precise skin closure exactly as you described, the cosmetic result can be very, very good. Occasionally, I'll have a, someone with a very long neck uh, who has obviously very, you know, invasive disease and may require a vertical extension, but that's less than 10% of my practice. Okay. Any other comments? Yeah, the one comment is that if you have to do the lateral neck, you don't have to do these hockey stick incisions. Cosmetically, they are terrible. What you do is you extend your thyroidectomy incision and add other skin crease type incisions for that, and you will take care of the cosmetic problem. Yeah, yeah. that's an excellent point. Thank you both very much.